As we go on, you'll find it's quite an improvement. <laughs> How many hired the show last night? Pretty good average, 173, I think. You won't forget. No, I'm. Oh, me. I thought you were. All right. Are we all ready? You may fire when ready, uh, Dwan. George is cute. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. You wouldn't think he's wanted by the police <laughs> in three cities. I have a job to do. All right. All right. Don't worry about me. You mind your business, I'll mind mine. <laughs> I'm no Budinsky. <laughs> You know, gentlemen. with Bauer and then... Uh... <laughs> I was just thinking, of Bauer and Aldridge, now, they're now going to run for mayor. It really doesn't make any difference. Mickey Cohn's going to run the city anyhow. <laughs> anyhow, I gave that woman her house back. <laughs> that was the thing that was underemphasized in this whole thing, you know. They all forgot about this woman. I was... Lying awake night, worrying about it. What a crook that pierce. <laughs> you know, the awful part of it is, that may be going on all the time in this town. I mean, people losing their houses for bills of 8 or $9. Dollars. If this hadn't come up, nobody would have found out about it. If she'd lost her house, I would have been... Go ahead, George. <laughs> <clears throat> Just go ahead. Don't bother me. Ladies and gentlemen. He calls himself an announcer. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is head. H-E-A-D. Really? You bet your life. Elgin American, creators of America's most beautiful compact, smartest cigarette cases, finest dresser sets, present Groucho Marx in the Elgin American show, You'll Bet Your Life, the comedy quiz series produced and transcribed from Hollywood. And here's that sterling Elgin American, the one, the only... Welcome for Elgin American Compacts, Mr. Marx. Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx. Thank you, thank you. Tonight we have $1,000 for one of our couples. George Fenneman, who's first to try and take it away from me? Just before we went on the air, the studio audience selected a bachelor and a spinster to be on the show. And here they are. Miss Harriet DeBow and Mr. Norton Schreiner meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, welcome to the Elgin American program, folks. And if you say the secret word at any time we're talking, you'll each win the amazing new Apollo 16 millimeter sound movie projector. It's a common word, something you use every day. Miss uh, DeBow, is that? Yes, sir. DeBow, is that yes, sir. French? Yes, it is. Harriet? French descent. Mm -hmm. huh? French descent. French descent. It's good enough for me. Now, you're a spinster, eh? Yes, I am, sir. What kind of uh, work do you do, uh, Harry? Well, I, for 20 years, I was a telephone supervisor and 20 years a hotel clerk. I'm now retired and going to school. You're kind of doing the whole thing backwards, aren't you? I started out to work very young. You started out to work and now you're going to school. Yes, sir. You romp to school in the morning, bring the teacher an apple or something? No, I go to evening school. I'm taking up vocabulary. What do you bring in the evening? Uh, pancakes? Or... Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, now, you just, how long have you been going to school? About uh, six months, sir. Six months, huh? You teach his pet? Well, I'd like Some to be. Some of them do. Uh, no, I mean... Uh, <laughs> That's an old joke. Just ignore that. You'd like to be the... Is it a man, man teacher? No, it's a miss. Oh. It's a minister like myself. Forget it. You're silly to even go there. Right? <laughs> You're telling me. <laughs> if you just walk up and down in front of your house, you do much better. <laughs> Mr. Schreiner? Norton, Norton Schreiner, is that... 
Right. You're a bachelor. Yes, sir. Now, what do you do besides bacheloring? Well, I'm a relief man down in the Italian kitchen in, hell, in Los Angeles. You speak Italian? No, sir, I don't. What kind of relief do you bring them down there? <laughs> well, just relieve other men so they can have a day off every week. Uh-huh. Once a week. Well, that's, that's a good job. You just work once a week? No, sir, I work six days a week. They have six men that uh, get relieved? Right? Yes, sir. Suppose they had seven men, you'd be out of a job. <laughs> Where are you from, Mr. Schreiner? From Seattle. Seattle, Washington. Yes, sir. Mighty nice city. Good fishing. Are you a stranger to Southern California? No, sir. I've been here about 20 years. 20 years, huh? Well, you better make up your mind whether you're going to stay before your round trip ticket expires. <laughs> How long have you been a bachelor? 47 years. 47 years? Yes, sir. How old are you? Forty-seven. Oh, you were a bachelor even when you were a kid? No, not that long ago. How long have you been a bachelor, Harriet? Twenty-five years. Twenty-five years. Huh? Spencer, I meant. Twenty-five years. Twenty-five. You're twenty-five years old? No. Twenty-five years a spinster. You're not born a spinster. <laughs> No, I wasn't, then. <laughs> and how old are you now, Harriet? Within reason. Within reason? Yeah. Sixty. Sixty. You know. And, uh, Mr. Norton, what's the reason you're not married? Well, I never met the right kind of a girl, I believe. And, uh, would you, would you like to get married? Yes, sir, if I met the right person. Mm-hmm. Why? Why do you, why would you want to get married? Well, for love and companionship. And so, either one or just, uh, <laughs> Are there, are there many bachelors in your family? None. No, no. I'm the only one. Bachelors don't run in your family, eh? If they did, they wouldn't be bachelors, eh? You've never been hooked, eh? No, sir. You've been, have you been on the brink of uh, being hooked? Yes, sir. I went with a girl for about two years, and uh, I think I was rather slow on the romance, and uh, they got acquainted with my cousins, and that was the end of it. You got acquainted with your cousin? No, sir. She did. Oh, she did, huh? And uh, your cousin married her? Uh, evidently. I never saw her. What do you mean? You never heard from your cousin again? <laughs> you ought to investigate that, huh? Maybe you have enough cousins that you don't care what happens to one little one. Why are you still single, Harriet, a charming woman like you? Thank you. Well, I had... I had three chances. Three chances? And Mm -hmm. you struck out? I was too particular, I think. I lost them. Your, your standards were too high, huh? That's what I think, yes. And now, I mean, would, your, uh, would you lower the standards? Or? Indeed, I would. <laughs> well, there's no reason why you shouldn't lower the standards. Clancy lowered the boom. <laughs> so you would get married if the right man came along. Indeed, huh? I would. Uh, uh, Mr. Schreiner, what uh, type woman do you prefer? The bold, aggressive type or the sweet, helpless, clinging vine type? I prefer the sweet, helpless, clinging type, but not too helpless. Not too helpless? Not too helpless. You don't mind how much they cling, though, eh? No, sir. You know, you could get a grapevine and you wouldn't have to... you get the same effect and it wouldn't cost you anything. Except that the roots uh, keep uh, getting mixed up with the tomatoes. Now, uh... You know, I have much idea what I'm talking about. I think that makes it unanimous. Now, Harriet, uh, which type are you? Are you the clinging vine type or are you the aggressive, uh, the aggressive type? Well, I could be either one, but I'd rather be the clinging vine. But you're not sure which you are, huh? Now, suppose you found a woman you greatly admired, Norton. How would you pursue your courtship? Well, by being charming and polite and taking her candy once a month. There's no danger of that girl getting diabetes. You seriously think that a box of candy would last a girl a month? Well, I don't know. I doubt it. You'd have to supplement that with something else, you know. 
frankfurters or apples or <laughs> banana splits or something? And uh, how would you be charming, I mean, specifically? What would you do? Do you turn the charm on and off like hot water? Or? Well, you can do that you that can, way. Yes. But, and how do you do it, I mean? Well, Ogle by being pleasant. Pleasant. Well, that's a pretty fair way to do it. What would you, where would you take her for entertainment, has she seen night at the opera at the Mark Hell Theater? Well, uh, take her well, to don't the... you consider that entertainment? Huh? No, we'll take her to the park. With, uh, take her to the, the park? The zoo. Well, if I had my choice, I'd take the park, too. You take her to the zoo? Yes, sir. You think that would be safe? Well, you can learn about wildlife and the birds and the bees. I didn't know they had bees in the zoo. Why don't you take it to a, what do they call it, an aviary or something like that? Well, they have that in the park. Oh, do they do. You're pretty familiar with the park, aren't you? <laughs> kind of a park expert. How does this all sound to you, Harriet? Uh, would you be interested in a man like Norton here? Well, I'm <laughs> I think she's measuring you for size. And he has hair on top of his head. That's that's the... Harriet, you said it. You said head. And so you each win an Apollo 16 millimeter sound movie projector. Oh, thank you. Not only that, you could walk out of here with over $1,000 tonight. You're really using your head to good advantage tonight, Harriet. Well, thank you, sir. Well, you're a sweet, young, lavender, blue, dilly, dilly, blue. <laughs> and here are your gifts from Elgin American. For Norton, the silver finished cigarette case. Uh, Norton, get a load of all that scroll and gravy there, huh? And for Harriet... Oh, what I've always wanted for my it? dresser. Well... <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? I Daddy, never she... could afford to buy myself a beautiful Elgin set like that. Thank you so much. Well, it's a pleasure to give it to you. Well, thank you, sir. Don't take it to school with you, that's all. <laughs> now, you have this lovely jewelless bronze dresser set with raised design, and I hope you're very happy with it, Harriet. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, what's the closest you ever came to marriage, Harriet? Well, the second sweetheart that proposed to me was very, very fond of me, but, of course, I was quite young. And uh, while, after we were engaged, why, I went out with other boys. So, of course, he didn't like that. You didn't? No. <laughs> Some fellows are nuts, aren't they? Yeah. He thought I was a butterfly or something, I guess, and so he didn't want to take any chances. So he asked me to return the engagement ring, which I did. And I've never been sorry for it. Yeah. And what happened to the third one? Well, the third one went away to war. And the first one? Well, the first one, he, uh, well, he uh, entered the uh, monastery. Well, there's all kinds of escapes, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, would you still marry him today, uh, this, uh, this one with the butterfly episode, Harriet? Oh, I don't believe I would. You, why not? He's married now. He's got about seven children. He's got seven children, and you Six wouldn't marry seven. him? Huh? No, no. Mm-mm. Would you marry him if he had four children and was married? No, I don't believe I would. You would. Well, you're, a st- you're a stickler, aren't you? <laughs> now, what was your most embarrassing experience, Mr. Schreiner? Well, when I was younger, I uh, had a tendency to walk in my sleep. And my folks had company one night, and I walked without any clothes down, down through the company and back upstairs and went to bed and I didn't know anything about it until the next morning. My folks told me I was very embarrassed. <laughs> you make a habit of doing this? Not so many more. You don't, huh? You go to bed with an overcoat on now, I suppose. Huh? <laughs> How old did you say you were, Norton? Twelve years old. You are now 12 years old? I was 12 years old. Oh, you were 12 years old. Well, that age, it's not so important. Now, uh, let's say that, let's pretend that I'm your father. Harriet, you pretend you've made up your mind about Norton and you want to marry him. You come into the parlor and I'm sitting there knitting a hot water bottle. What for? Well, it looks better, I think, knitted. And you ask my permission. Now, you go ahead. What would you say to me? I'm your father now and you ask me. 
They were only pretending. You're my father? Yeah, I'm your father. <laughs> you want to marry this chap, and you come in the parlor, and I'm sitting there. Well, Father, I'd like to marry this uh, young man. I know he's much younger than I am, but I probably need a younger man. <laughs> That would be nice. He wants the clinging vine. I can be a clinging vine. Well, at this moment, the water is running out of the hot water bottle. <laughs> well, my son has expensive tastes. Uh, could you could you support me, too? Yes, I'd be willing to support you, too. Mm, he's a growing boy, you know. Would you care for him through his customary childhood ailments like gout and rheumatism? <laughs> yes, I would. Falling arches? Huh? Yes, I would. He's always had a roof over his head. Could you give him a nice home? Where? No, he'd have to provide the home for me. Would there be room enough for me, too? Yes, indeed. We'd make room for you. Well, Harry, do you have my permission? You may marry my son. Eh? <laughs> Blessings on thee, little man, barefoot boy with cheeks of tan. My name is Groucho Marx, and I'm 81 years old. <laughs> now, uh, Norton, what have you got to say for yourself? Well, I don't know. Why don't you marry her, father? <laughs> I'd be only too glad to, but I don't think my wife would let me get away with it. Huh? <laughs> now, in just one minute, you'll play the Elgin American game for $1,000. You bet your life. But first, Mr. Fenneman. Have you looked at your mother's compact lately? Mother's Day is May 8th, and an exquisite new Elgin American compact is the glorious gift of beauty and utility she'll carry with the greatest pride for a long, long time. Because it's first in fashion, jewel-like in finish, and perfectly made the famous Elgin American way. Tomorrow, see these preferred compacts in smart costume colors, silver finish, jeweler's bronze, and sterling silver at your favorite store, and at the price you want to pay. And see also Elgin American's thrilling new companion line of compacts, American Beauty, priced as low as two ninety-five. Tell Mother she's number one with you by giving her a superb new compact with America's number one name, Elgin American. Now, let's see if you two will get a chance at the $1,000 question. You're going to play your bet your life. Fenneman, tell them the rules. Each of our three couples has $20. They bet as much of that 20 as they want in each of four questions. The couple that earns the most money gets a chance at the $1,000 question at the end of the show. Our other two couples are in a waiting room off stage, so they won't know what goes on until it's their turn. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. What question category did you select? The co-stars in recent movies. That's right. Now, here's your first question. How much of the 20 are you going to go for? $10. $10. Who played opposite Bob Hope in The Pale Face? Uh, Jane Russell. Jane Russell is right. <laughs> They're on their way with $30. Remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. How much of your $30 will you try? 20 20? Is that all right, yes, uh, Harriet? Mm-hmm. Who played opposite Jane Wyman and Johnny Belinda? Uh, Lou Ayers. Lou Ayers is correct. <laughs> now they have $50. Here's your third question. You have $50. How much are you going to try this time? 40. 40. You don't care what Harriet says. Well, I'm the clinging vine. Oh, you're the he clinging can do vine. Whatever all right. he says is okay. Oh, fine. Who played opposite Loretta Young and Mother as a freshman? Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson. <laughs> Way, they have $90. You have climbed up to $90. Here's your last chance to beat the other couples. How much will you try? All of it. All of it. Who played opposite Madeline Carroll and Don't Trust Your Husband? Uh, Fred McMurray. Fred McMurray is right. And they wind up with $180. Don't forget, you each won an Apollo Sound movie projector for saying the secret word. Thanks, and good luck from Elgin American Compacts. Now, don't go away. You still have a chance at the big question. Perhaps the next couple will say the secret word, too, Groucho. Remember, it's head. They've been in a waiting room off stage. Okay, boys, bring them in. Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected a telephone operator and a housewife. And here they come. Operator Pat Gilbert 
and housewife Jean Benjamino meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, girls. Welcome to the Elgin American program. And if you say the secret word at any time we're talking, you'll each win the amazing new Apollo 16 millimeter sound movie projector. It's a common word, something you use every day. Miss uh, Gilbert, uh, you're, the, you're the telephone operator, eh? Yes. Where are you from? Uh, oh. Patricia. Patricia uh-huh. Gilbert. The telephone company. <laughs> you're from the telephone company. Huh? <laughs> That's where you were born? Well, sometimes I think so. Uh-huh. Well, I've been in the hands of the receiver many times. I thought. <laughs> and now, uh, now that we're past that uh, place of flowers, where, where, where are you from, uh, Pat? Uh, I'm from Plymouth, Massachusetts. Plymouth, Massachusetts. Yes. Rhode Island, right? Uh-huh. Well, you look much no. better than that rock up there. I'll say that. Oh. <laughs> are you Are you married, uh, Pat? No, uh, I'm not. You know, I'm pretty happy about it, too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a man are you pursu- are you working for? Uh, oh well, I'm not very fussy. Someone like Gregory Peck, about six foot four, and black hair, you know, just an ordinary. Mm. Would you take Gregory Peck? Would you take Gregory Peck if he was six foot two? Well, uh, I'd consider it. <laughs> What kind of a man are you, are you working for now, uh, Pat? What kind of a man am I working for? Aren't you working for anybody? Don't you have a boss there? Uh, no, there's all women where I work, They're unfortunately. All bosses, uh... <laughs> yes. Mrs. Uh, Jean uh, Benjamino? Yes. You uh, Italian uh, descent? No, I'm not. You're not? I'm Irish. Irish, yeah. Uh, Italian name, though. Uh, husband? My husband's Italian. Husband. We've been ignoring you, but I suppose you've been eavesdropping here. Yes, I have. After all, this is a party line. (laughs) Where are you from? uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. And uh, how many children do you have? One. One. What does your husband do? He's a civilian patrolman. uh, How many children does your husband have? One. You say your husband is a civilian patrolman? Yes, sir. What is, what is that? Well, he works for the War Department. He's a patrolman for them. Uh, the War Department? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. How'd you meet him? Oh, well, I was on maternity floor. And, uh... You were on the floor? I was on... <laughs> I was in charge of the floor. I'm a registered nurse. Oh. And uh, he was up there visiting. The first time I saw him, he visited this lady three times. And I saw him out in the hall looking at the baby, so he stopped me and asked me for a date. Uh, I said no to him, naturally. I told him he had married, he had a wife and baby. He says, oh, no, that's my sister that I've been visiting. Do you believe that? Yes. <laughs> yes. So the next night I was... Nurses are notoriously susceptible. <laughs> the next night I was down in the kitchen drinking coffee about 10.30, and all these nurses were coming in off their date, and I heard this rapping on the window. I looked up and there was this handsome guy that didn't ask me for the date. So I'm, I'm sorry, Mrs. Benjamino. Your, your three minutes are up. You'll have to deposit <laughs> another ten cents, huh? <laughs> go, right, go right ahead. Uh, don't pay any attention to me at all. Well, Nobody else does. He asked me to go crabbing with him. Go next, where? Go crabbing with him. Crabbing? Next, yes, sir. Soft or hard shell? Soft. <laughs> I told him no. Well, he says, if you don't give me a date to go crabbing with me tomorrow, I'm going to raise everybody up in the hospital. I'm going to wake everybody up. He was pretty crabby already, wasn't he? <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll go crabbing with you tomorrow if you'll just get away from me. You know, I didn't mean to keep that well, date. Have you ever gone crabbing with anybody else before? Is that the customary procedure for romance in the Yes, during the, during the summertime, they go crabbing. They don't go dancing? They go crabbing, everybody? <laughs> they go dancing, too. Well... While they're crabbing? Uh, <laughs> and do they go crabbing while they're dancing? I imagine some of them do. <laughs> so, now you're in the boat, huh? No, uh, I was asleep the next day, because uh, uh, I was sleeping, and I was on night duty. So, uh, I heard this rap, rap on the door, and the matron comes in, and she says, there's a nice young man out here you want to go crabbing with him. I said, oh, no. She says, oh, get up. Evidently, he had sat the source of the matron and convinced him that 
I should go crabbing with him. So she talked to me and talked me into going crabbing with him. So... <laughs> He was a very persuasive fellow. He, he? he certainly was. And is he still very persuasive? Yes, he, he is. He talk you into anything? Yeah. Well, he talked me into three months crabbing with him. <laughs> and when the crabbing season was over, well, we just got yes, ready to Yes, what did you married. do when the crabbing season was over? <laughs> I mean, there comes a time in every couple's life when the crabbing season is over. <laughs> Crabbing starts all over again. <laughs> so? Well, we got married. After the crabbing, the deluge. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, operator, do you mind if I give you a buzz again? What kind of an operator are you? Huh? Oh, a telephone operator. I'm the operator you get when you dial O. Oh, I see. I must dial O more often. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you're the bell of the phone company. Huh? <laughs> as a, as yeah. a phone operator, how many hours a day are you on the phone? Oh, eight hours. You spend eight hours a day on the phone, huh? Mm-hmm. Typical woman. Oh. <laughs> I don't see how you get any work done. <laughs> now, housewife, you had an average day. How much time do you spend talking on the phone? Oh, about an hour altogether. An hour. And what do these fo- uh, calls consist of, mostly? Social calls. Social calls. Yes. And what do you talk about? Well, most of my sister calls me up and talks about her boyfriend most of the time, and my arm gets broke. I'm <laughs> propped against the table, and here she goes. She talks, talks, talks. Why? I she... don't do any talking. She does it all. What is? What does she talk? What is the gist of this? I mean, is she complaining about her boyfriend, or? Well, she's just giving me the whole story of everything that happens. <laughs> and is there a new story every morning? <laughs> no, it's the same old story. So that's when I just sit there and listen. I see. Well, you could put stuff in your ears, you know. I guess I could go make the beds up and watch she and yeah. come back again. She'd never know I left the phone. Oh. <laughs> well, try that tomorrow, will you? <laughs> well, we have some wonderful gifts for each of you. Elgin Americans Jewelers Bronze Compact Engraved with Flowers. It's perfect for Mother's Day. Thank you so much. Oh, this is beautiful. And operator, how do you like it? Oh, Isn't that a very nice number? Mm, just what I want. I hope it has a nice mirror. Now, line is busy. To satisfy my curiosity, why aren't there men telephone operators? Well, uh, we did have them when the company first started, but uh, they were very discourteous to the customers, and they used bad language, and they didn't have the patience that girls have to sit there all day. So finally, they decided to have women operators, you know, the voice with the smile. (laughs) Yeah, very pretty smile. (laughs) I thought it was because if a man answered, everybody would hang up. <laughs> what, what, what training is, is necessary for your job, Pat? Well, uh, we go through 12 weeks training on, um, with a, an instructor on a dummy board. A dummy board? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, is there anything like a smorgasbord? <laughs> what is a dummy board? Well, it uh, may have to look just like a real board, but uh, the only thing is, uh, it seems like you're on a real board, but it's not connected up. They can't put any calls through. And the board of directors are all dummies? They sit around there watching? <laughs> How can you tell when some swindler sticks a slug in a phone instead of a nickel? Well, I listen to money so often I can tell by the tone of the bell. It doesn't remember that. I've lost a lot of slugs lately. <laughs> oh. I always thought you operators bit the nickel face before you put the call through. Right? <laughs> Must get pretty monotonous sitting there all day, doesn't it? Um, what do you do for relaxation? Um, Take the plug out for a canter around the park? Oh, that's an idea. <laughs> How often do you have a rest period, Pat? Oh, we have a rest period about every two hours. Uh-huh. Do you ever get angry with a, with a subscriber who balls you out? Oh, no. I'm trained to be very... Uh, Patient and curious. I never get angry. You never get angry. Huh? No. <laughs> Tread softly and carry a big stick. Yeah. <laughs> you grit your, your teeth. <laughs> grit your teeth. Well, you have nice teeth. You can grit them. <laughs> if I grit mine, they'll fall out. Huh? <laughs> You treat your customers with a great deal of respect and reverence. I've noticed that you always observe two full minutes of silence before you answer a call. Oh! That's because we're busy. You're busy, huh? Now, what's the strangest call you ever had, Pat? Um. And what's the strangest Pat you ever had call, huh? <laughs> well, one of the strangest calls the other day, this man called me up and he said, 
operator, how about fixing me up on a date tonight with a blonde? <laughs> I have a lot of calls like that. But uh-huh. this one, uh, I don't know <laughs> what he thought it was, the lonely hot spiral. <laughs> you don't answer any of those calls at all? Suppose it had been for a brunette. Well. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's the most embarrassing experience you've ever had? Most embarrassing experience? Well, I can't think of any single one. Oh, well, the other day I um, answered this call. It was a private line signal. I was so busy working, I didn't notice. I took it for a coin box. So I pressed the coin return, and I said, please deposit 40 cents for three minutes. <laughs> and he said, uh, operator, I'm speaking from my own home. <laughs> Where do I deposit it? <laughs> is my face red? <laughs> He could have dropped it in the garbage disposal. <laughs> now, what was the most expensive call you ever had, Pat? Well, um, I don't you know too many expensive ones, but last year when I worked on long distance, I had uh, a man placing a series of calls about three or four to Europe, to England, and places like that. And it must have amounted up to about $400. I think he was a movie producer <laughs> of course, I don't listen in. You didn't eavesdrop at all? No. <laughs> Not at all? Well, uh, sometimes you have to listen a little to see if they're getting the right number. <laughs> might, have, might have been Rita and Allie, you know. <laughs> in that case. I'm you know, the most expensive telephone call I ever made only cost me a nickel. I proposed to my wife on the phone. <laughs> It was a party line. I got five acceptances and three refusals. <laughs> now, wrong number. On your job, you must overhear some fascinating conversations. Do you ever learn any state secrets? Um, no. N- no, well, we're not, we don't listen. Don't That's listen. against rule X923. Is that the rule? Yes. Can you give me that number again? <laughs> well, something like that. What is it, X0923? Yeah. That's a good number, huh? <laughs> I like your number better now. How do you know? Uh, how do you know when my three minutes are up on a long-distance call? Well, uh, when you start talking, I have a clock there, and I time it. And I uh, I know just what time your three minutes is up, so I notify you then. Mm-hmm. And housewife, what's your chief complaint against the phone company, in addition to your sister? <laughs> <laughs> well, I when I get my bill, I think they will really charge me. They charge too much. because or They can't count or something because it seems like the... They've got more calls on the bill than I can recall making. <laughs> In other words, you're implying that they're crooks, is that it? <laughs> I can have it. It's worse than a laundry bill. I can't figure mine out. <laughs> Extra calls, they don't know no details or anything. Mm. Now, what have you got to say to that operator? Well, That's a pretty uh, serious charge. It's the customer's fault because they don't realize how t- long they talk. Three minutes. Don't blame her. It's her sister, isn't it? Right. <laughs> well, what advice do you have for your customers? Well, um. Do you have anything to tell them that could uh, cut down their phone bill? Cut down their phone bill? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe to time their calls or not to talk so much. <laughs> not to now, go suppo- into such detail. <laughs> oh, I see. Now, well, suppose, suppose I called you up and try to make a date with you. What would you do? I suppose I'd call you up and say, uh, Operator, uh, what are you doing tonight? Well, I've heard uh, your voice over the phone, and it's, it's <laughs> very musical. All and the time. It does, huh? Well, what do you do? How do you answer that? Huh? Well, I try to get around it, give them the brush off, or mm-hmm. uh, talk them out of it, or be very businesslike. If I can't get rid of them, I give them to the supervisor. And, let and her he hear. goes out with you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know. I can't hear <laughs> Recently, I was talking to a friend who only lived three blocks away, but I could hardly hear him. What would you say was the trouble? Oh, I guess you had a bad connection. Connection? He was hollering out the window. (laughs) A busy signal. What are your favorite complaints against telephone subscribers? Oh, uh, they're not very courteous. And besides that, they treat treat us like we're a machine. And after all, we're not... (laughs) You certainly don't look like a machine to me, Pat, huh? Oh, thank you. That was the way machinery looked. I'd become an engineer in the morning, huh? <laughs> well, let's see how, how you handle a call. Pretend I'm placing a call to Sam Magawidawisk in Glendale. I just dial operator. Now, go ahead. Uh, what is the name, please? Sam Magawidawisk. Uh... <laughs> How do you spell that? S-A-M, Sam. I mean, the other name, Mr. Whiskey Whisk. If I could 
spell it, I'd write him a letter. Uh (laughs) Well, it was very instructive having you here. Now, let's play you bet your life. If you run your $20 into more than the other couples, you get a chance at the $1,000 question. Fenneman, remind our listeners how much the first couple won. Here we go. Let's see how high you can build your twenty dollars. What question category did you select? The popular songs by Harold Arlen. Oh, Arlen. that's right. Here's your first question. How much of the twenty are you going to try? I'm going to try how much of the twenty. Two. Two. Speak two. right ten. up loud. Ten. There's over two hundred people listening. To this all over America. Huh? <laughs> ten. We'll try. Ten dollars. You're going to try. Give me the title of this great Arlen tune. Play, Jerry. Stormy weather. Stormy weather is right. We now have $30. Remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. How much of the $1,000, uh, wait, how much of your $30 will you go for? I got a little ahead of myself there. 30. 25. 25. What's the name of this Arlen song written in collaboration with Johnny Mercer? Between you now, take your time and think it over carefully. That old black magic. That old black magic is right. Now, the real other way now, they have $55. You now have $55, and here's your third question and how much of the $55 will you angle on this? $50. 50 Let's see if you can identify this all in melody. Okay, Jerry. Is your last chance to beat the other couples? How much of the 105 will you nibble at? 105? 105? No, say just a five. No, Coach, you know how much the other couple won. 90? Okay, well, 90. $90, huh? In German, they call that Oscar Reagan. All right, $90, huh? What's the name of this melody by Harold Allen? Thanks, and good luck from Elgin American Compacts. Now, in just one minute, our last couple will play your bet your life. And then we know who gets the chance at the $1,000 question. Fenneman, say something new for a change. How about a nice recipe? A recipe? All right, Groucho, how's this? A recipe for happiness. Take a lovely new Elgin American dresser set. Give it to Mother on May 8th, Mother's Day. And see how perfectly delighted she'll be. This is the gift that really dresses up a bedroom. It's the unusual gift that proves you gave thought to Mother's Big Day. These dresser sets come in a range of easy prices and lovely designs, with or without matching powder jars. Combs are hand-cut, bristles are nylon, mirrors are specially ground for extra clear reflection. Every detail is Elgin American Perfect for the perfect gift Mother deserves. See these beautiful, beautiful dresser sets tomorrow. For the Mother's Day gift she'll cherish for the special look it gives her bedroom. For that special cared-for feeling it gives her. Give a charming new dresser set by Elgin American. Now then, we'll soon know who's going to earn the most money tonight and get the chance at the $1,000 question. George, who's ahead so far? Well, the telephone operator and the housewife are ahead with $195. And here's our final couple, Groucho. They've been in a waiting room off stage, so they don't know the secret word is head. Okay, boys, bring them in. Just before we went on the air, our studio audience selected an antique dealer, Mr. Ed Roberts, and a dealer in war surplus materials, Mr. Sam Groden. Gentlemen, meet Groucho Marx. Welcome, gentlemen, welcome for Elgin American Compacts. And if you say the secret word at any time we're talking, you'll each win the amazing 16-millimeter Apollo Sound movie projector. It's a common word, something you use every day. An antique dealer, eh? Uh, Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts, Groucho. Boston, Massachusetts. That's the home of the antique, isn't it? That's right. In a nice way, I mean. And uh, where is your antique shop? My antique shop is located at 9095 Santa Monica Boulevard. Are you uh, married? No, I'm not, Groucho. Have you got a girlfriend? I sure have. Are you going to get married? 
Well, that lies in the future. Well, it usually does. Huh? <laughs> how, how did you meet your girlfriend? Well, we were walking. I was walking along Hollywood Boulevard one day, Groucho. That's the place for it, then. Right near the corner of Vine. La Brea isn't bad, either. <laughs> I got one a couple of weeks ago from a top there. I bumped in... Part, you pardon me, Mr. Roberts. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I bumped into her while uh, she was walking along. She was carrying a lot of bundles. And the bundles scattered all over the street. I bent down to help her pick them up. And at the same time she did, and our heads bumped... My head is bumping too tonight, dear. Here we go again. You said it, head, and that's the secret word. So that means you each win an Apollo 16 millimeter sound movie projector. It's also highly possible that you might walk off with a thousand dollars for the big question tonight. Now, where were we before you poked your head into this show? Huh? I was bumping my head. You were bumping heads, huh? You were doing the bumps on Hollywood Boulevard, huh? That's right. And uh, what happened? Well, I helped her pick up her packages, and we went into one of the drugstores for a coke. We started to talk, and ever since then, we've both been talking. What happened to the bundles? Did you ever find out what was in the bundles? No, I didn't, girl. Did it ever occur to you that perhaps this was a device on her part to hook you? <laughs> no, it sure didn't. It, you look like I... a pretty hep young guy, and I'm surprised that you should get fooled by anything as obvious as that. <laughs> we do, no matter how hep we are. If it doesn't make any difference, no. Ultimately, you'll get hooked, eh? <laughs> well, Mr. Grote, Sam Groton, uh, you're the war cyclist. Yes, sir. We have two stores. Oh, One now, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's get in a few words about Elgin in American place, eh? <laughs> you have two stores, eh? That's right. You deal in war cyclists. That's right. How many times have you been indicted? Uh... <laughs> how's, how's business, Mr. Groton? Just fair. Business is fair, huh? Fair. Well, even that's pretty good. Who wants to buy a cyclist war? Huh? <laughs> and we got a brand new one coming up. Huh? <laughs> Where are you from, Mr. Groden? Los Angeles. I'm a native son. Native son, huh? Some native daughters out there would like to hook you, too. I guess. Already married. Already married. Are you wasting your time? <laughs> You are married, eh? That's right. Is your uh, present wife your first sweetheart? No, she isn't. Mm-hmm. What happened to the others? Well, they just Did you sell them as Cyprus? <laughs> no, I didn't sell them as surplus. Uh, when I went in the Navy, I just forgot about them. That's a typical Navy attitude. Isn't it? <laughs> now, uh, Mr. Roberts, the antique dealer, just, just what is an antique? An antique is generally, uh, has a general conception of being at least over 100 years old. That's that the uh, only qualification? That's the main qualification for an antique. Well, I'm coming down the stretch. You can, uh, <laughs> you can get me in about three months, huh? Is your girlfriend fond of antiques? She sure is. Mm-hmm. Well, will you... Uh, the next time you bump into her, uh, will you give her my phone number? <laughs> What was your most unusual experience as an antique dealer? Well, Groucho, uh, my most unusual experience was having a woman walk in the shop, and she was uh, shopping for a soup terrain. Well, she... Any particular kind? Noodle or matzo ball? Or... <laughs> Probably matzo ball. Matzo ball, right? Are she... there differences uh, between soup terrains? I mean... Uh... Not as far as uh, matzo and <laughs> noodles, but... You mean uh, soup terrine is a soup terrine. I mean, it'll, it'll handle matzo balls or noodles, huh? Right. <laughs> I'm glad to know that, you know. I thought she had a different kind for each one, huh? So, anyway... Well, anyway, she found one that she liked very much. The only uh, trouble with it is that I had to remind her that most soup terrines had two handles. This was not a soup terrine, as it only had one handle. <laughs> She liked it well enough from Barton anyway. I think she's serving soup now. Well, I'll skim over that. Eh? <laughs> how do you, how do you junk dealers? I, I mean, antique dealers. Uh, 
How do you get those holes in old furniture? Do you have a little squad of trained worms that, uh... No, if the piece is antique, then it's got those holes in it already. Yeah, sir. Well, how does it get the holes in it? I mean, well, just... I don't know who trained the little worms, but evidently there were worms at one time that did make the holes in the pieces. And that's the uh, only uh, test of an antique? It has no, a... that isn't the only test, but it's one of them. Where do you get your antiques? Well, I have all of my antiques shipped you in. You breed your own worms? <laughs> you have them all shipped in? I have them shipped in from the New England states. My mother does the buying back there from various private estates. Long trips uh, she makes through the uh, small towns? And That's right, through the small towns of New England. Have you uh, ever been fooled by a phony one? Uh, I sure have. How do, how do people get bamboozled by uh, antiques? Well, when I first started in the business, I went ahead and bought something that I believe genuinely to be an antique. A man walked in and I tried to sell him this piece and found out that he'd reproduced it himself less than two years before that time. Well, when you get stuck with an antique that was made in Grand Rapids, uh... <laughs> are you always successful in palming it off on some sucker? None of my antiques come from Grand Rapids. Oh, they don't. I remember one time in New England, I nearly got stuck with an antique. <laughs> But I knew instantly our paint, our paint was cracked in the wrong places. Right? <laughs> Actually, your legs were what fooled me. I thought they were Duncan Fife legs. As a matter of fact, they did belong to Duncan Fife. I know, because he came back the next morning and got them. He was pretty drunk. His name might have been Drunken Fife. I don't remember. <laughs> Now, uh, war surplus, you've been standing there like you were surplus. Uh, wake up, you're about to make a sale. Tell me, uh, just what do you sell? Well, you name it, we have it. <laughs> okay, watermelons. <laughs> I mean, specifically, what do you sell? Oh. You so name it, tents. we have it, huh? You sell what? Tents, tarps, tents. Uh, tarps. shovels. What's a tarp? Life huh? bolts, life belts. Sell lifeboats? Lifeboats. You have water in your store? <laughs> Not very far from the water. Well, how do they find out if the boat is uh, non leakable? Right? Well, these are all brand new boats. They come in original cartons. <laughs> how big are these scows? Well, it's a seven man boat. You mean seven men have to come in at one time to buy this thing? Well, one man can come one in. One man comes in and buys it? That's right. Well, how long would you say it is? Then? Oh, it's about 18 foot long. Well, what do they use them for? Go fishing in them. <laughs> they don't go in the water. They just fish in the boat? I mean, are that big? Oh, well, no, they take them down to surf them, take them out and go fish them. Are they good, uh, good boats? Oh, brand what new. What do you sell them for? $49.95, and that includes the fishing equipment, anchors, sea anchors, sails, oars. There's a... Not an outboard motor with it, huh? No, no. <laughs> no we don't hey, supply I might the buy out- one of those. It's huh? a good deal. Yeah. Where would you use it, huh? Well, take it on to the beach. Even road handle one of those, huh? Oh, it's easy. Mm. Anything else you sell in your stores? Oh, shovels. May West. <laughs> How much is May West? I'm like, come in. Here. <laughs> we sell her for $1.95. We also have uh, life belts and uh, jackets and shoes. You're all ready for a war, aren't you? <laughs> no, not right now. No, not right now. Were you in the war, the last one? I was in the Navy. Did you have your own boat? In the, Navy? <laughs> well, the government supplied one for me. Well, what was your most embarrassing experience, uh, war assets? <laughs> The most embarrassing experience is when I got married. The judge was going through the ceremony, and uh, I kept saying, I do, I do, I do, and the judge says, one I do is enough. That was just about my most embarrassing experience. What'd you say? I do. <laughs> you just kept on repeating it, even after he uh, told you it was enough. Huh? I'm still doing it. I do. <laughs> well, you're just an old yes man at home, man. Eh? Not quite. Well, just to show you how welcome you are, we have an Elgin American silver finished cigarette case for each of you. 
Right. These have an engraved panel design. Now, War Cyclist, just uh, what does uh, most of your merchandise come from? Well, Army, Navy, and the Marine Corps. You were in the Navy, huh? That's right. I bet you had the biggest duffel bag in the Navy. Huh? <laughs> You had trouble getting off the boat, didn't you? <laughs> what did they do? Did they lift you off every time you went off? No, well, not quite. You I were just... able to get off under your own power. Always huh? jump ship. <laughs> Why does the Navy give you those things? Why don't they use it themselves? Uh, I don't know. I guess as soon as the war starts, everything is a scarcity of everything. They start looking around for all the things they just gave away. <laughs> I'll never understand the whole thing, eh? Well, you don't know any more about it than the next man, I suppose. And the next man happens to be an antique dealer. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's only interested in Civil War ciphers. <laughs> Look at him there, dreaming of Lillian Russell's bustle. <laughs> what, what Navy ciphers do most people buy, Mr. Groden? Well, clothing's our biggest item. Clothing, huh? Yeah? What's the largest item you have for sale? Well, that's that big Civil Man lifeboat I was telling you about. <laughs> Here we are, back in the water again. <laughs> Now, Antique, let me jerk you away from the War of 1812 and bring you back to 1949. Well, I've still got some change in my pocket. What's the most valuable antique in your shop? Well, I have a very uh, beautiful French porcelain steeple clock. Mm -hmm. why, why is it valuable? Well, it's approximately 400 years old, and it's a very beautiful item, very desirable. Very few of them in the country. Mm -hmm. Where'd you get it? was purchased in New England from one of those private estates I was telling you about. And what is it uh, up for now? I mean, how much would it cost? Well, the price to you, Groucho, would be very small. I'd give you a dealer's discount, which would only cost you $350. I can get a boat for $49. <laughs> Does this clock run? I wouldn't guarantee it, Groucho. Well, it wouldn't make any difference. I never know what time it is anyhow. Right? <laughs> now, look, I'm not going to buy anything, but do you have any rare bargains in addition to that? I mean, something a little cheaper? Nothing, not, yeah? Not too much, Groucho. Well, what was your most embarrassing experience, Mr. Roberts? Well, the most embarrassing experience I ever had, Groucho, was when I was invited to a basketball game. I was going to high school at the time. I thought there'd be a mixed crowd there. I walked in and unfortunately found myself the only male in the crowd. The entire gymnasium was full of, full of women. And you must have had a field day, huh? <laughs> Not quite. All I got was a lot of whistles and catcalls. Oh, and you didn't uh, do well at all then? Not too well, Groucho. Didn't get in the game at all? No, I was on the sidelines. My Aunt Minnie has a passion for collecting old spinning wheels and fixing them. She can fix them so they stop on any number she wants to. <laughs> now, let's see how you work together as a team for $1,000. You're the last couple to play you bet you like. You beat the other two couples and you get the $1,000 question. I can't tell you how much they won, but George is off stage to remind our listeners. Here we go. Let's see how high I can build you $20. What question category did you select? That one about the racetracks. Ra ra racetracks, yeah. Now, here's your first question. How much of the 20 will you go for? Ten? Is that all right with you, Eddie? That's fine. All right. And what state is Rockingham Park? It's in Narragansett. Uh, oh, wait a minute. What, what state? state? Uh, what state? New Hampshire. New Hampshire is right. That's a tough one. They're off with $30. Yeah, remember, you're going for $1,000 tonight. How much of your $30 will you try? We'll go for the 30 right? You're going for the 30 yeah? That's right. Well, you'll be clean on the second question. Well, I'll be clean if I don't get to the right racetrack, aren't I? <laughs> Where is Oak Lawn Park racetrack? Chicago. I, Illinois. No, uh, I, I'm sorry. It's Arkansas. That was a tough one. You bet all your money and didn't do so well. I'm too soft-hearted to let you go home broke, so I'm going to give you one more chance. You get this one right and you win $10. It's a toughie, so think hard now. What large ocean washes the Atlantic coast of the United States? The Atlantic. <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean is around. And Rocco, that means that the telephone operator and the housewife with $195 get the chance of the $1,000 question. <laughs> In 
know, it's hard, isn't it, to decide between a new Elgin American Compact and a dresser set for your Mother's Day gift. Either one will make her extremely proud and happy because it's an Elgin American. And remember, that preferred name is on Elgin American's brand new companion line of compacts to American Beauty, priced as low as two ninety five. Mother will certainly appreciate your perfect taste in choosing a compact or dresser set made by America's leader, Elgin American. And here's the winning couple, the telephone operator and the housewife. Well, back again to try for $1,000, eh? Good luck. I'll give you 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you, so talk it over thoroughly and no help in the audience, please. Here it is for $1,000 in cash. The first Republican candidate for the presidency was a famous soldier who was known as the Pathfinder of the West. What was his name for $1,000? Think it over. And uh, what is the uh, what is the answer you two have decided upon? William Cullen Bryant. No, I, I'm sorry. The answer is General John C. Fremont, a great soldier and leader. Oh, he explored every part of the West, but he just couldn't find his way into the White House. So that means the big question next week will be worth one thousand five hundred dollars. You've been a wonderful team, and in addition to the sixteen millimeter Apollo Sound movie projector, you each won. You also earned one hundred and ninety five dollars in the quiz. Congratulations and thanks to both of you. The Elgin American Show, You Bet Your Life, is a John Goodell production transcribed from Hollywood, directed by Bob Dwan and Bernie Smith. Music by Jerry Fielding. Remember, next week's big question pays $1,500. Be sure to tune in again next Wednesday night at this time for You Bet Your Life, starring Groucho Marx, presented by the creators of America's most beautiful compacts, smartest cigarette cases, and finest dresser sets. Good night, folks. Young man, have you looked at your mother's compact lately? <laughs>